Welcome in to the DNVR Avalanche Podcast presented by DraftKings Sportsbook. Use code DNVR when you sign up for a new account to get amazing odds boosts every single day. Rudo and AJ coming to you live on a Wednesday hump day as the Avs have the day off. Sitting here, messing around last night. On the internet, as you do when your job is hockey involved, on statistical websites and just looking up random stuff. It doesn't look like you're on the internet. It looks like you're in the it, forest. It's impressive that it I get such good internet out here. You'd be surprised. I tell uh, you, that connection must be killer. It's crazy. It really is. But a thought crossed my mind. Did it hurt? It didn't, but it did feel weird (laughs) because I didn't really think about it when I looked it up. I just kind of thought in my head, you know what? Uh, Miko Rantanen is a surefire lock for being a top three in a redraft of 2015, right? No. And then I looked it up and I was like, oh, he's not. (laughs) And obviously McDavid's at the top, so the one spot is gone. But the conversation gets very interesting after that. You have Miko Rantanen in that conversation. You have Mitch Marner in that conversation. Then you have, uh, where do you want to go? Do you want to give Jack Eichel that spot? Do you want to look at some of the other guys that could potentially go in that spot, like a Sebastian Ajo? It, it gets interesting after after number one. Yeah, I mean, I think... Uh... I think he would have to have him in the same conversation as like Marner. Sure. Um, you know, the center wing debate would be right. fierce That's, on this. Yep. Um, yeah, I forget Kaprizov's in that draft too. Mm, he sure is. And <clears throat> so you're you're talking about like this is a total like like pick your poison kind of like. Unless you're the Arizona Coyotes, you absolutely cannot go wrong in that redraft <laughs> because we know that the Coyotes would be like Noah Hannafin, and you're like, some things never change. Boston didn't um, exactly knock that one out the park either, but yeah, Boston, Boston really dropped that ball. <laughs> um, no, I just think in that in that redraft, it would be a fascinating. Like it'll always be a fun thing to talk about because you know McDavid is the clear cut number one. You can't make an argument for anybody else. I don't care the the amount of mental gymnastics it would take to try and come to a conclusion of McDavid not at number one is not worth it. I, he's number one. Let's. That's not yeah. even worth it. Yeah, it's it's number one, and then after that, like. Look, I think I think for a long time, even even for the first you know three or four years of their career, I think Jack Eichel was still the easy like number two. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like a big center like that is uh, is a is a really tantalizing prospect. I mean, Sebastian Ajo um, as a as a two way center. Yep. But I think I think Ajo has maybe failed to take that last I agree little I'd, I'd have, extra step. I'd have Miko ahead of Ajo if you ask yeah. him. Well and I think I would have all of Marner, Kaprizov, and Rantanen yeah. ahead cool. ahead of, of Ajo. If you're talking about we just want the best player. But if it's we're starting a franchise a center. from yeah. scratch. Yeah. Because we have seen uh we have seen the perilousness of trying to build your best player as a wing and trying to build around that guy is very, very difficult. I mean, had, who has successfully done that? Chicago and I mean, and Chicago, the Chicago Capitals finally got there after over a decade. And you look at Washington and down the middle, they had Nick Backstrom and Evgeny Kuznetsov. Yeah. Nick Backstrom, a borderline Hall of Fame case for me. And Evgeny Kuznetsov. I don't even think he's that borderline. Like Kuznetsov, very, very good. Yeah. Um, so you're you're talking about they successfully found center uh like After the center to, yeah. to go to go along with Ovi. Yeah. But when you talk about Crosby versus Ovechkin, I think I think it more than anything highlights the 
uh, uh, just center versus wing. Yep. Uh, and then, <clears throat> um, so it's it's like if you if we were redrafting from where those franchises were, uh, in in 2015, I think it would be fast. Edmonton still takes McDavid, but Buffalo at two. Like if you're Buffalo, do you just take Eichel again? Do you take Aho? Yeah, it's really tough. Buffalo would be in a really tough spot. Yeah, well, and Arizona's in the same spot because do you want Marner? Do you want Kaprizov? Because you're going to get you, one of those two guys would absolutely be available. Yep. But I mean, Eichel, like, Eichel, Eichel has shown himself to be a good player, like a, a really a great one. But has he, is he, is he, in that same level, yeah. See, Matt Barzell for me isn't Not on that, that same tier. level. Yeah. Great what player, about, but where I mean, where do you put a guy like Thomas Shabbat, who's done absolutely That's everything been for a Ottawa? Stud of a defenseman back there on a terrible hockey team. Like you know what? Where now? I I think a lower tier, not in contention for uh, the second pick, but. Um, I agree. You know, a, a, Z- a Zach Wierenski too. Right. You're still going to have that run of D that are very, very good, just not quite that level. Yeah. And I mean, I haven't even said his name. The guy had 40 goals last year. I mean, you have freaking Kyle Connor just sitting around mm-hmm. here too. Yep. You know, now you might have a problem with how Kyle Connor is very, uh, his very opt in, opt out on any given day playing defense. But offensively, the guy is. Well, electric. so was Miko for a while there. So, well, well, and I think this is the conversation that that really kind of brings everything back around on Rantanen is, yeah, um, Rudo. For me, I want to ask you: Has this stretch of games changed your opinion of Rantanen any? Um, <sighs> just with him having to be like solo superstar, because for much of Rantanen's career. He's had a high end center to play with. Anytime McKinnon has been hurt the last few years, Nazem Kadri's been there. Yeah. It he's has, now had to spend like a month with JT Comfer as his center and has kind of just put keeps the rolling wrong. Yeah. yeah. He is he is backpacking the avalanche uh to to like a wild card spot right now. I don't think changed is the right word. Validated. I would say is probably more accurate. Okay. In a sense of, I think you and I certainly always do that. Miko was this good. It was just trying to get that out of him consistently. And without McKinnon around, without this other high end talent around Miko has played some of the best hockey. I think he's ever played in the last three weeks. Not that he isn't really good, hasn't been really good in the past, but you've seen... (sighs) I don't ever want to hear anybody say Miko Rantanen is a product of Nathan McKinnon ever again. I'll put it that way. Totally. Like, it was always, always like, an annoying storyline, but without them being able to be separated from each other, it was always, like... Like, McKinnon was always the guy that was going to get that credit. Although, for me... I always looked at it and was like, okay, well, there were multiple years of Nathan McKinnon in the league before Miko, and what did he look like? Where he was meh. And then after Miko got to the league, what has McKinnon looked like? So who's a product of whom here? Now, they're both obviously special players, and I don't think they make either one, like, each other. I'm sure they make each other better, but... (laughs) Well, that's the thing, is I think they're both both high-caliber players, um... Uh, I I see like a, some of this abs. It's even in chat that he doesn't get enough love. Like Rantanen, Rantanen is like universally thought of as like a top. I don't know, like three or four wing. Yeah, in and, the and... NHL, uh, like, like a top three or four right wing in the NHL. I I don't know what more love you really want. He's not well... slam dunk number one. I want to continue this conversation one, because we're going to pair those wings, but two, I want to continue the conversation of wing versus center and where Miko actually falls. Is he top 20? Well, first of all, I just, as a, a quick side, Mitch Marner has taken two face-offs this year and lost both of them. 
So trying to give Mitch Marner props for being good at faceoffs isn't going to fly here. <laughs> He's also 47% in his career, and he hasn't even taken 200 of them. So <laughs> the rest of everything said about Mitch Marner in chat is true. He's excellent. But yeah. out of curiosity, I looked I looked him up. So anyway, whatever. <laughs> um, I just... Sometimes chat gives me reasons to go into a rabbit hole where I look something up out of curiosity. Love it. <laughs> um, and I was I was like, oh, is he good at faceoffs? Because you know, like Landeskog, we know Landeskog plays wing, but is like fifty percent, fifty plus percent on faceoffs in his career because he takes a ton of them. Yep. But Mitch Marner is over two this year. So Nico also does take a decent amount of faceoffs. Doesn't do great on him, though. And is not... Yeah, I mean, he's not Alex Newhook level bad, but... Yeah. <laughs> it's a pretty low bar, to say yeah. the least. Yeah. So, is what it is there. It's... Yeah, so, you wanted to talk uh, where does he rank among the elites, or do you want to still to stick with center versus wing? Let's uh, Let's talk about just the wings first. Let's talk about Miko versus his direct competition on the wing. When you look at production, there are four wings that have more raw points than Miko right now this year. That being Kaprizov, Pasternak, Kucherov, and Jason Robertson, who's really kind of a center. Oh, he's a left wing. Yeah, you think? Yeah. Either way. Those are uh, the- I, you know... Oh, he's, he's he's on the right side of the ice. I mean, Pavel, Pavel, Pavelski's in the middle of that, and uh, Rupe Hintz is the other wing there. So I don't know. This is kind of the hard part with wings is that they can they can flip flop. I'm not situation. particularly worried about left and right. I'm just calling them all wings, to be honest with you. Like there are some guys that that will straight up just play one. Yeah. Like Ovech, Ovechkin has been on the left wing forever. He also like got two years into his career and then just switched sides because he wanted to. Like <laughs> so, yeah. So anyway, um, we don't. I guess we don't have to get like super into the weeds on right versus left, but and, yeah, it's just not worth it to me when you had their wings. They're all wings. Who's the best? <laughs> or rather, where does Miko fall? Is I know you were talking about before the show five on five production, things like that. Yeah, I had a, so there were people who were not, um, there were people like who did not love my Miko Ranton. If the season ended today, Miko Rantanen would not be substantially involved in the heart trophy voting uh, I, take. Uh, this is the whole other conversation, which I'm happy to go into because like, you're definitely correct on how it's voted. I think it yeah. becomes a more interesting conversation if you're actually talking about the most valuable player to a hockey team. Well, and that's and that's where it's like for me you even even if you uh even if you have that conversation about like value, how do you make a single argument for Miko Rantanen as more valuable to the Avalanche even during this stretch of games than Kirill Kaprizov is to the Wild? And I'm not and saying he cause, wins cause, that, I'm sure, but Kaprizov, he's in the conversation. <laughs> Kaprizov is is on a just on a lesser team, team. anything, yeah. And they're 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 almost in the same place standings wise, um, with Minnesota a touch ahead. So um, I even if you just ignore that Connor McDavid is 20 points ahead of him in scoring, um, and and you're just like okay. How valuable can he really be? Leon Dreisaitl is there, and they're barely in a playoff position and all sure. that. Like, okay, but McDavid is still going to be there. Um, I just – I don't see where you have a single argument for Miko Rantanen ahead of Kaprizov. So that, for me, that's where I'm just like, okay, now now we're talking about him. As, it's, for me, it starts with third place. And then you look at – I think the that other conversation's guys. closer than you make it. I think Kaprizov probably still wins it, but I don't think he's running away from Miko there. I don't think he's dominating him, but I just think that when you when you break them down side by side, there's another star player in Colorado that is sure. going to and, and of course Kale is a wrench in that in that 
debate for sure if when it comes to value, but because it, in Minnesota, who's the other star? Yeah, I, I, there's no one certainly of that pedigree. But when you're talking about offensive production, you're getting a good year out of Matt Zuccarello. Yeah, and Zuccarello's career has taken a an uptick in Minnesota with Kaprizov. <laughs> with when he got there and got put next to Kirill Kaprizov. Yeah. <clears throat> so so uh, but anyway, like it's not for me. It's not like a, I'm not trying to like tear down Miko Rantanen or anything. I I don't know how many and, times I've and, had to say he's been exceptional. And, and again, it's it's a moot point because the way the award is actually voted on is who's the best player in the league and Miko's not not close to top three in that category yeah, right now. Well and and like you always like look at the scoring list, right? And you're like, okay, so uh like Eric Carlson would would probably because of the way that they vote for the Norris. Yep. Eric Carlson would probably lose some hard hard stuff there. Um, like uh, even if McDavid you David and Drysaitel cannibalizing well, each other a little bit, McDavid is just so far ahead it, of yeah, right. everybody, everybody else. I mean, he's ten he's ten points ahead of Drysaitel. Dude's on and pace for like a seventy goal season. Like, yeah, and he's he's sixteen points ahead of Jason Robertson. And again, Jason Robertson is a guy that I think you would probably vote for the heart ahead of Miko for sure. Yeah. Um, and then, and then you have like the really like uh, Kaprizov is, is basically the same number of points. Um, and then you get, you get the Tage Thompson, uh, Elias Patterson. Like these guys are having exceptional years on not very good teams. How do yeah. you value those? I think everybody's going to do it a little bit differently, but I think there will be enough people who are looking at T- what Tage Thompson is doing and being like, well, I'm, you know, even with Buffalo being bad, I'm still giving that guy a third place vote over Miko Rantanen in the fourth place in the central division avalanche. If the avalanche were leading the division, I think it would be a different story. Yeah. The fact that they're just like in the pack, they're like just in this big cluster of teams and haven't separated. It's, it's hard to say again where like where we go. So let me separates. let me ask you this then. If Miko continues producing the way he has, the Avs get guys back, and once they're healthy and have their star players, if that ever happens, and they ascend to the top of the Western Conference or Central Division or whatever, can Miko get himself into that conversation a little bit better? And like, I get it. He's not going to catch McDavid. That's not the conversation I'm having, but could we be talking about Miko as a top 10, top five caliber guy? Sure. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, it's, it's really tough, man. Like, a lot of really good players in the league. I know. I, I like. I'm genuinely asking because right now uh, he's certainly not in the top ten. I'm not even sure he's in the top twenty if we expand this to to centers and certainly defensemen. So I don't know. We'll 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 get into yeah. it. Yeah, we'll talk think... about that. But <laughs> before that, we are brought to you by. It's tough. I mean. How many how many things are better in life than beer and burritos, honestly? Because you can go right now, get yourself a Breck brew at your local liquor store. Use the Breck beer locator online to find it near you. Or you can always go down to the DNVR bar where you have eight different kinds of their beer on tap. Breck brew, been great to us. They've supported us for a very, very long time. We love them over there. But you can add to your Breck brew experience by going out and getting an Illegal Pete's burrito to eat with it. So when you so- jump... On that, you can get Illegal Pete's happy hour over there. It's from 3 to 6 p.m. If you want to get margaritas instead of beer or something like that, uh, you can also still get in on their holiday deal where you get a $100 gift card and they add $25 on for free. So you can get tons of delicious Illegal Pete's. Check them both out. Breckbrew.com for the Breck Brew. Just go to Illegal Pete's to get your burritos. Deliciousness. Second period of the DNVR Avalanche podcast presented by DraftKings Sportsbook. I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves here. 
How many wings are better we, than Nico Rantanen? Can we can we just really quick touch on news of the day? Uh, oh yeah, since, yeah. As the pod <laughs> started, uh, the Bedner presser was taking place, yep. and um, we had to choose between things to do today, so we didn't have anybody there. But uh, for the record, uh, people are people are getting into the uh, Val has no timeline for return. I would like to say there were two reporters in that room who tweeted out two different things yep. about Val Nachushkin, okay? Because one tweeted out he was day-to-day, and the other tweeted out there's no timeline for his return. One of those is significantly more ominous than the other, yep. so I absolutely would just like to listen to the presser and hear what, what, what verbiage Bednar actually used, uh, but I don't think it's a big surprise that uh, it that 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 the the news is that Nachushkin has re-injured the surgically repaired ankle because it we were we were talking it, like it sure it, looked it like look it, good. yeah yeah <laughs> it just didn't look good it looked like it was it when when he's like throwing one timers that are just muffins on the net and you're yeah. like he's not getting any drive there's no leverage here he is. He's able to stand up, but he's not able to to be Val. Yeah. So um, I think it's uh, we'll just see. I don't know. I don't know how good or bad that is, just based on the timeline of things. But I, it's it really just drives home the the abs just have not gotten any injury luck this year. Yep. Obviously, they've had a lot of injuries, but like this is the you know. Val hurt the ankle in the Stanley Cup final, uh, and then I think had surgery it. on it, and then and then had surgery at the start of the year. Yep. And uh, you talk about Darren Helm had the same thing. Like Darren Helm had offseason surgery, and then the season redone. Yeah, basically had to redo the thing. And you're like, what is going on here? They're they're getting surgery, and it's not that Landeskog had another surgery. Like, yep. talking about multiple guys needing multiple surgeries now after the playoff run, where we knew there was going to be some of this that not that happened February of the next year. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but like, yeah, I broke his foot in the final. Thank you. Um, and his ankle was what he hurt earlier this year. Um, yeah. And and it's just like the I don't know. Uh but without without actually having a like again, because he's day to day for now, we don't really know what his timeline and there is no timeline and he's day to day. Those are two things where who knows? Like yeah. uh, there are gonna be people who immediately are just like, I just have this gut feeling that he's done for the year, and it's like Okay. And he did, ten days just, later he's on the ice or something. Just as true that he could be skating tomorrow. Like you just have no idea right now. Right. Um what it what is is that uh, I, I don't think that um he's not gonna he's not in the lineup for right now, and boy do they miss him because yep. you just see the difference that he makes. Yep. Um you see you see the uh the way that the Avs play their team defense when they have both Lekkinen and Nachushkin on different lines and in a game, their top six just chews up the other top six. Skates people into the dirt with their forecheck and just their solid defensive mm-hmm. play. Like, it's yep. ridiculous. Those two guys uh, elevate Colorado's floor so much, it, it blows my mind. Yep. Um, anyway, one less winger for, for Miko to compete with. For this, <laughs> Val fucking wishes to be yeah, honest. I know. Like, I no, know. no offense, but Val fucking wishes. But, um, I would, I mean, I would say like it's it's really hard because you do start at the top of this. You you do say okay, uh, you know, you've got Jason Robertson, you've got Nikita Kucherov, you've got David Pasternak, you've got Kirill Kaprizov, Miko Rantanen, and Mitch what? Marner, or Tebby Panarin. So this is uh, Makachuk. Like I, I think you can pretty Jesus. comfortably say Jason Robertson and Nikita Kucherov have had a have had a better year than Miko Rantanen so far. Uh, I, yeah, okay. I, I think it gets more interesting after that when you start comparing Miko to Pasta to Kaprizov. You I, maybe even throw I, I wish, in that conversation. I, I wish I wish Kaprizov actually had. 
some talent. Yeah. Some guys around him that were closer to his level. For sure. You know, obviously we're talking about uh, the we're, the reason we're talking so much about Miko uh is because um he has not had Nathan McKinnon right. for the last month, but he had him for the two months before that. Uh so it's you know. Yeah, there there's always context there and it matters. Yeah, if if Kirill Kaprizov got two months to play with Nathan McKinnon, what would his numbers look like? I have no idea. I don't think that they could be too much better, but <laughs> they might. He might. He might have like an extra eight points or something. You know. Well, you might have and, an extra twenty-five points. I have no and idea. And this is where this conversation becomes interesting. You were looking it up before, AJ. Miko has twenty even strength goals this year. Yes, some of those come at six on five, and I guess four on four, three on three, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, significantly more goals at that strength than guys like Kaprizov and Pasternak, though. Yeah, um, but less than Jason Robertson. Yeah, again, I look, I, I think if you're talking about who's the better player so far this season, it's Jason Robertson and it's not that close. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think Robertson's pretty significantly outplayed Miko. So I'm willing to accept that. But when you're comparing him to Pasta, to you know, um, Kucherov, uh, probably just outplayed him as we, well. Can we focus but... strictly on this Pasternak thing? Because I think it's really fascinating. Yeah, look, who's better, uh, Pasta or Miko? Go for it. I got Miko, and I'll tell you why. Um, When I watch, and, and this is... I haven't done like an analytics deep dive to actually oh, compare sure. them, but watching both of them play, I would prefer Miko because there's a power to his game when he wants it to be. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, there's a the way that the way that they get their offense is really different because, especially with Miko in the situation he's in right now, he's driving so much of their offense he's driving the play he's at the heart of everything when you watch Pasternak he doesn't drive it so much as yeah. they funnel a, their offense he's an off him. puck player that finishes right and he's just an unbelievable goal scorer yep. like he is I I, I I say this and Pasternak and Rantanen have the same number the same number of uh of goals but Miko shoots, shoots at a much higher percentage or something. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, Pasternak has 50 shots on goal more yeah. because Boston funnels all of their offense when he's on the ice, the whole strategy, we saw it in both Boston games uh, when they played the abs, yep. the whole strategy was get the puck to that guy. Yep. And the strategy when Miko is on the ice, even when McKinnon's out there, it's not, get the puck to him when you look at how those teams well when you look at how those teams have their power plays boston's is we're we're, we're setting plays for for Pasternak. we are driving because we want this guy we have we have decided to go through this guy and how many times do you have miko ranton yeah, standing on the was- goal line Trying to go for this fucking golf chip over a goalie's shoulder, just dicking around. I was gonna Not say, even yeah, part strategy of it. with Miko is kind of let Miko do whatever the hell he wants. Like, for the most like, part. <laughs> what day is it? Like Miko, yeah. like pulls a pulls a, a a play style out of a hat when they're fully healthy, and he's like, "I'm this guy today." <laughs> but without without McKinnon, he's had to be pure power forward every night. He's had to drive. I mean, we literally saw him last night go one on five. It didn't yep. work, <laughs> but he tried like, it. The poke that uh, they poked it away from him, but the abs ended up deep in the offensive zone because when five guy, guys collapsed on one, they poked the puck away and an av picked it up and the, it got cycled deep into the zone still. So it was like, it, in, in essence, it was, it still worked out just fine for Colorado. Um, and, and with Miko, it's, it's all about the way he's driving play. The way that the way he's initiating the offense and he's it all it all starts with him and with Pasternak in Boston, it's all finishing with him. And when we know that when the abs are healthy, when McKinnon is healthy, when Landis is healthy, 
Miko can do that role, but yeah. he really likes being a high end playmaker. Mm-hmm. And like, it's funny because uh, Pasternak actually he has more assists right now, but I would also say has not had any problems with the guys around him this year. Um, he does not have JT Comfer as his center. Has had talent around him, also sitting on 22 power play points and 10 power play goals. Tomiko's <laughs> Miko's had plenty of power play production, 17 points, but only yeah. four goals there. Yeah, the the power play the power play goals, and this is kind of what I mean. That's that's like a big separator is you look at the way that they run their power plays and uh, 10 to four in power play goals for Pasternak. Boston is funneling everything through him yep. and Colorado's not with Miko. Even now, even, even with the way that it is now, they're not setting him up. It's not Miko bombing away one timers all night. Like he occasionally fires one off, but that's just not their strategy. Genuinely. I'm not sure why, like, I understand that they've still got Kale McCarr and Evan Rodriguez is on the other side. And, hey, Evan Rodriguez is a whale of a one-timer. But Miko Rantanen is a, is, is a guy that has shot like 18% his entire career and is a 30-40 goal lock every single season, for health this, permitting. Uh, I don't know if this is overstepping a little bit, but Miko Rantanen at his best when he has that power to his game Reminds me of a young Alex Ovechkin. It, he reminds me of Bjarmer Yager, dude. That's why we yeah, called him Baby Yager I, I when it started. It. I, I get where you're coming from there, but it's what pushes me more towards Ovi is Miko's one-time ability. And I get that he plays the other side and is the other handedness, but yeah, he still has that laser beam of a one-timer that is such a... Uh, because he does so many other things and produces with assists and, and so many other different ways, I, I can see where you'd move away from that. But I, I think people forget, especially when you see Miko doing things like running people over like he did the other night. That's how Ovi <laughs> used to play. Yeah, I mean, it's still how Ovi occasionally plays. I mean, Not near as much these days, but... Gotta, gotta protect the goods. There's some business <laughs> decisions that gotta get made when you're like 38 and... Um, and, and like I get, obviously anyway. Ovi has the greatest one timer of all time by eighty miles. It's not close, but yeah, there's there's a little bit of that in Miko. Is all I'm saying. Yeah, like pick a power forward, right? Like, and yep. pick a pick. Like people aren't gonna like this, but you know, back in the day, one of the premier power forwards in the NHL was Todd Bertuzzi, yep. because that guy that guy would just truck over people. Now. Obviously, that, you know, he broke bad with that kind of mentality. But, uh, I mean, like, pick again, pick a power forward. Pick a, pick a guy that plays with a high-skill game that just runs people over. And, you know, the when, when Rantanen plays like that, he pushes Matt Kachuk in terms of top power forward in the NHL. Agreed. But it, it, the big problem, the big problem is that we know, we know that when McKinnon is around, it's gonna go away real fast. Yeah, it, it, he picks his spots. Like there are games where he, like, of all the guys on this list, nobody drifts through a game more than Miko Rantanen when he's got that star power around him. Mm, I think you can catch Kucherov doing something similar at times, but you could tell me on that. I would I'm fully actually I would just agree with you. He does have drifty tendencies. Yeah. Um those guys those guys kind of have and to you know he's not quite on the same level but Kyle Connor also is a guy that will drift through a game disappear at times a little bit, yeah. Yeah. So, it's, and then those dudes have two points at the end of the game though, so you're like, well, <laughs> yeah, but I mean you're talking about like in in a true like power forward like realm here, like this is still Makachuk's world. Um, I agree. As, as I, far as I am fine, power Enrique. Forward. Thank you. <laughs> I, he's up, he's upstairs. I don't Why know. is he yelling at you? Yeah, I don't know. All caps. I don't know what the deal is. <laughs> okay. Uh, on that note, we are brought to you by DraftKings Sportsbook. You use code DNVR to go over there and bet on whatever you like right now. Again, probably not wise to bet on Miko Rantanen to win the heart. Uh, 
Also probably not wise for him to bet on him winning the rocket, but he probably has a better chance at that than the heart. Uh, He's only <laughs> seven goals behind. Yeah, that's that feels like McDavid goes on a little bit of a cold streak. Miko decides he wants to start shooting a little bit more. You never know. Makachuk is not overrated. Get out yeah, of here with that. I don't know. Don't agree with that. Makachuk is dope as hell. Yeah, uh, I mean, you can you can dislike all the nonsense in his game, but he is a very, very, very good player. Whoever you want to bet on, you can go over there and use code DNVR when you sign up for a new account. And when you bet $5 on an NHL team to win their next game with that new account, and you win, you get $150 in free bets, which you can go bet on whatever you want. So check it out at DraftKings Sportsbook. Must be 21 or older, Colorado only. Other terms, restrictions, and conditions apply. See the show notes down below for details. Of course, if you have a gambling problem, call 1-800-522-4700. Uh, we're also brought to you by Game Time. If you want to go see the Moose in person over at Ball Arena, you can get your tickets through Game Time. There's a link down in the description of the video. Over 15 million people have used Game Time to get prices up to 60% off face value. So a great deal, which is something you certainly need to afford Avs tickets right now. Uh, they are not a cheap watch at the moment, which tends to happen when you're a really good team that has a championship under their belt and things like that. So be sure to check out Game Time. The link down below does help us out a little bit too if you use it. So click on that and get their app today. Third period of the DNVR Avalanche podcast presented by DraftKings Sportsbook. So let's expand this conversation. Start including centers. Is Miko a top 10 forward in the NHL right now? I think if you include defensemen, he's certainly not a top 10 player. Yeah, I don't know that he, I don't know if I'd have him as a top 10 forward, but what I, what I will say, what I, where I think, where I think Miko separates from all of these guys, um, because we're talking like, he's got that power. Um, so he's, you know, uh, power forward. It's Kachuk, right? Yep. He's got that. He he's got that playmaking. When you look at the elite playmaking wings in the league, it's Kucherov, it's Panarin, uh, it's Marner. The thing is, uh, he does he does everything, right? It's like... Kaprizov. It's those guys. Um, you look at um, uh, elite goal scoring wings. It's it's Robertson. It's Pasternak, and Miko Miko Rantanen is a combination of. All of those guys. Yep. He's the only one on this list that I would say is if you break if you break it into if you break forwards if we're gonna break the wings specifically into goal scorer primarily playmaker primarily and power forward. Is he top uh, five in all three categories? Exactly what I'm saying. He's the yeah. only guy that you would put in the top five of all of those. Yeah, because he does all of that, and that's what makes him. Special. That's what makes him, yeah, that's what makes him different from all those other cats. Uh, if you start getting involved in the centers, uh, you start bringing all the centers into this, you bring in McDavid, you bring in Drysaddle, you bring in Crosby, you bring in Pedersen, uh, you you bring in Tage Thompson, you bring in Nathan McKinnon. Uh, <laughs> and I don't, I, I'm going to have a really hard time putting Miko ahead of McKinnon. Yeah. But... <laughs> At the same time, like I, I don't think that the gap is very big between them anymore, uh, and I think that that's where this stretch, the way that he has, the way that he has uh, embraced this kind of okay, I've got to dominate. I know I've got to be the man, and we've seen that it's drawn that out of him, that more consistent, all around yeah. effort where you see him not taking the the lazy man's way out of out of plays and out of situations he's dominating dudes yeah he's not dude, almost all of the cute shit that has driven me nuts for the last two years has been eliminated from his game because he's had to keep it simple and he has he has had to be straightforward we're just gonna play like this i i would die to see this this version of miko show up every night next to nathan mckinnon because I, it might push them into unstoppable territory they're, together. They're scoring like 150 points each a year at that point. There's <laughs> something ridiculous, yeah. Well, they both would certainly hit 100. Well, let's start to that let's, first. Fair enough. Let's yeah. start there. Let's let's have a 100-point season before we start trying to chase <laughs> some history here. And 
I think that's also what frustrates me about Rantanen and why I'm apprehensive to be like, oh, he's this guy or that guy. Uh, because as we know the second that Nathan McKinnon comes back. It's going to change. Yeah, He's going to be like, oh, all right. Back in the back in the sidecar, okay. I'm not 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 you know not in the main seat anymore. I got this. Um, but it's it is noteworthy that Miko has been this good, and I'm I think just, I would say he's earned his super license with this stretch of uh, yes. of driving. <laughs> yes, well, more so than fucking Logan Sargent did. <laughs> um, Anyway, if, for the record, I think F2 is better than F1. Ah, more oh, fun. Oh, God. Not better. I, not better. Not, yeah. More fun. More competitive, maybe. <laughs> it it was just like any given race, there were like seven dudes where it was like, yeah, I could see that guy winning. Uh, and mass I, chaos. I, I get with what you're saying, but I can't agree with your take. It's not. It, obviously, the guys in F1 are much better drivers. <laughs> Um, but it's it's kind of like watching an ECHL game where you're just like, this is like really chaotic. <laughs> like this is a really fun version of hockey. This is kind of nuts and all over the place. Some Michael and, Jolie type is just gonna roll up and eat some fools for breakfast, and you're like, exactly. that was dope. Yeah. Well, and then and then you'll still like the ECHL still has like the the enforcer role. Yeah. Uh, still hanging around in it as a prominent feature on rosters. So you get a Michael Jolie type and then you get a John Scott type and you're like, it's like a really weird mixture of hockey. The HL is a lot closer to the NHL these days in terms of taking its development seriously. And it is more chaotic and a little more unstructured, but um, for my money, the AHL has surpassed the KHL as the yeah, second best league in the world. Certainly, make a good argument for that. Yeah. Um, so, and and I just think the ECHL is that perfect mixture of mass chaos and yeah. the, the hockey is also fun. Yep. So, anyway, um, where I think Miko ranks, as we were, as I've uh, like ducked this question, you, you've dodged show. it quite a few times at this point. Yes. <laughs> I think I think it would be fair to put him in the top ten forwards right now in this very moment. Probably somewhere at the eight, nine, ten, but yeah. Yeah, I would I would have both Edmonton guys ahead of him. I the the thing with like McDavid is the easy, like I would take McDavid over yeah, Miko. One on the planet. The really <laughs> hard yeah. part with Dry Sidle for me is is just the defensive side yeah well in in separating them i know that sure. they haven't played as much together this year and i actually haven't even looked at their numbers um but the, it doesn't they don't have to play together without. if dry sidles getting second lines right like yeah and it's and it's it's just for me it's it's hard to separate the impact that mcdavid will have um you know, on it's like a trickle down effect for Dry Sido. And so with Dry Sido, I'm like, I'm open to the idea of somebody preferring Ranton in over Dry Sido, but Dry, like you look at Dry Sido's production, you look head, at yeah. you you look at the consistency of it, and you look at just he's been an absolutely elite point producer. Uh and and it's really you know, you know how valuable scoring goals is and having a guy with a fifty goal season under his like it's tough. I look. I think McDavid, Drysital, Robertson, probably Thompson, and probably Kucherov. this year's Tage Thompson. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. If we're talking recent, I'd say those five are all squarely ahead of Miko, and then it becomes a conversation after that. Yeah, and it does like you and and you know you get into like a would you seriously take Miko Ranton in over Austin Matthews? And. Long term, probably not. Even but... even right now, like this on this given day, like knowing I that Matthews it. is his shooting percentage is a little bit lower than it normally is, but it... his all around game is is as good as it's ever been. Like, I, I, and again, I'm, like, sorry, I'm not taking Mika Rantanen over Austin well, and, Matthews, and, and this is like what's the context, right? 
Because if you know Nathan McKinnon's coming True. back, you're like, ah, I don't need Austin Matthews. But Yeah, well, I mean, McKinnon Matthews won too. That'd be stupid. <laughs> no offense to Miko, that's just down the middle. You're not ta- you're talking about trying to find a one right wing instead of a two C. Uh, whew. Whew. <laughs> um, you know, and and then even even down the line, like, would you take Miko Rantanen over Jack Hughes, Steven Stamkos? Yeah, I mean, I'd definitely take him over Stammer at this point. But like long term, sure. But in the moment, if right now, this season, I think I think I'd still I take still, him over Stammer. Jack is too. a different conversation. I think I still pick Nico today, but I could definitely see myself regretting that in a year or two. I think I, that's one where it's like I think it's where the center wing conversation sure. makes it a lot more interesting because like I'm taking Nico over William Nylander. Yeah, I don't think that one's that hard of a conversation. You know, I'm taking I'm taking Miko over uh, Kyle Connor, but when it's Jack Hughes down the middle, yeah, yeah. So, and that's where I think it's. I, I just think that that's a that's a tough conversation because also. If they swap spots, let's be real here. Jack Hughes is a picture perfect fit in Colorado yeah. and would have been the perfect pick had Colorado gotten some lotto luck. Um, and I know, like, this is no slight on Bo and Byram or anything like that, but the easiest 2C slot in of all Jack, time for Jack Hughes yeah. is 2C playing avalanche hockey, getting up, blazing up and down the ice. Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> The cadre trade may not happen, and they may not win the championship last year. So, no regrets. Like, no looking back and being like, I wish those things had happened. But holy smokes, would Jack Hughes have been nasty in Colorado. Yeah, it would have been a lot of fun. Yeah. And he, we would, they wouldn't have had to pick between them. Uh, they could have just had both. Had so, all this to say, Nico Ranton in, in the back half of the top ten forwards. And then you start throwing yeah. defensemen like Kale McCarr in there, and you're seeing this year's version of Eric Carlson. Yeah, right. And and suddenly he's you know maybe not even in the top fifteen players in the world. Yeah, I mean you you start to get into the defensemen, and you have this year, uh, you know, uh, McCarr, Fox, um, Josh Morrissey has had an unbelievably good season. As much as it makes me want to roll my eyes. You got to give him his props. He's been incredible, and his underlying numbers are exceptional. And so it's like, I can't even poke holes in that shit right now. Uh, Rasmus Dahlin has kind of had that kind of breakout season yep. that we've been sort of waiting for. Yep. Um, yeah, Pedersen of the Canucks is definitely uh, – Elias Pedersen is just one of those guys that <sighs> – he, he like, burned me in fantasy once. So <laughs> like I've got, like, a – but I think he's – He's so good, dude. He's really, really good. I wish he was that much more consistent. Oh, well, and that's how you feel about every guy in Carolina, too. Yeah. Uh, Ajo, Svechnikov, and Neches. Those are all guys where you're like, if they they were were just a that much more consistent. Like, day in, day out, consistently the best versions of themselves, Carolina would be like that team. They would be the team that we keep waiting them to for them to become. Yep. And they're a team. They're they're in that uh right now the Carolina Hurricanes, I think, are in that Washington Capitals. Like we've been burned by you in the playoffs with this core enough times that I'm not picking you until it it now. Yeah. Like like, I'm I'm picking against you at some point. Also, shout out my boy Brandon Montour having a hell of a year. Not better than Miko, but my guy popping off in Florida. Yeah. Also, somebody was asking earlier about uh, Matt Kachuk and why they're not very good. And, um, well, talk to their centers because both Sasha Barkov and Sam Reinhardt are not having great seasons. Sasha's been battling injuries, but... Sasha's had problems staying healthy. You see that cross-check he took to the knee off the face-off from... Nasty. Nasty. A couple weeks ago, man, that was... They were lucky that wasn't serious. So... Anyway, um, yeah, no, the uh, 
Josh Morrissey, you got to give him mad props. He has been uh, he's been awesome this year. He has 40 points in 35 games. Guy already has a career high in points and it's not it's not even the new year yet. Like that's and again, it you go and you look at his underlings and you're like, "Well, he's been super good." <laughs> so, anyway. We'll see. We'll see if he can keep it up. I don't know if that 10% shooting is going to last, but uh no, but <laughs> It, I, I would want to look at some, like some on ice shooting and, and like the jets are already because they've got so many injury issues right now. Sure. Um, you know, it's like, for me, there's some shot and Freud involved in watching them struggle through their injury issues while <laughs> the they were trucking along with their own problem. <laughs> yeah. When they smoked the abs in Winnipeg, they held a parade while the abs had an age held like, like, <laughs> The Eagles. It was very much the Eagle Lanch, and <laughs> it was a, uh, it was an interesting couple of days of discourse for sure. And then, you know, now it's like I, I wanted to see how they were going to keep going, but now they've got real injury problems, and yeah, I'm getting really tired of injuries, like, like ruining seasons. It's really and really for off. everyone. Yeah, like it's it just sucks, dude. Because you're like, dude, I just want to see how these teams stack up. You build these teams. I want to see. I want to see how they do. Can we stop with the major injuries, please? But that's not the way the world works, of course. The hockey it's... gods say no. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Nathaniel Hackett sure was like, oh my, he's having like a seance in his garage every night trying to get the injuries to stop for the <laughs> for for the Broncos this year. So, um, but no, that's it's it's interesting to the way that they've kind of dictated so much of how the season has played out so far. And they do every year, of course. All right. Anyway, Miko, Miko is the shit. He's a top 10 forward right now. I don't think he stays there, uh, but all love to Miko and everything that he has done. He has been the man. Also, who could have predicted that Paul Maurice would make Florida worse? Only everyone. Z is raising her hand enthusiastically. <laughs> People in Winnipeg know. <laughs> Somebody's got to know. Somebody's got to tell the world. I mean, I was trying. I, I think in our preview show, I was like, I tried really hard <laughs> yeah. to find reasons to drop them further. Yep. And I just didn't have the balls to really go all in on uh, uh, some of the other teams around them. Okay, so we wrap this one up. We got uh, we got yeah. Sean Barron's to watch in a couple hours here. Yeah, and um, we didn't. We, it's hard to spend much time on WJCs on the pod just because there's one Avs prospect yeah, there. It's just and not I'm, very relevant to Colorado right the now. The Avs the Avs have one one pick in the top five rounds this again this year, and we don't have a ton of confidence that they're keeping it. Yeah, so it's really really hard to. Get, get hyped on these yeah. kids. Yeah. <laughs> I will I will say Sean Barron's looks like uh a younger version of Tory Krug right now. Uh Abs fans should be guardedly optimistic, and I only say that because the best trade pieces that the Abs have are a first round pick, Oscar Olausen, and Sean Barron's. I is is Barron's the most untouchable of those three? I mean, given their prospect for pool. me, he should be. Yeah. For me. All right. Well, we're going to get out of here on that note. We appreciate all y'all hanging out with us on this Wednesday. We, of course, will have full game coverage tomorrow. Pre-game, I don't think the Nuggets play, so there should actually be a watch along. Uh, and then post-game for sure. So be sure to tune into all of that stuff for you. We appreciate you. We will talk to you tomorrow. And until then, we'll see you on the next one.